is still epiphany time. And epiphany means that we are being shown things. And we've been shown a lot of things so far, all the way back to the beginning of January. We've been shown that Jesus came not just for the people of Israel, but for the whole world. And that was symbolized by those wonderful wise men coming from afar. People who had no connection with the house of Israel, with the Torah. They didn't know the one true God, or maybe they did, but they came. And then we were shown who Jesus is. Or when his cousin John was told by Jesus, baptize me in the Jordan River, it was not like all the other hundreds of baptisms that John did there. The heaven opened, a dove came down, the spirit, and the father's voice was heard. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then we were shown more. One of the first things Jesus does as he begins his work it is he attends with his mother and his disciples and relatives a wedding in Cain of Galilee. And they run out of wine. And his mother says, help them. And he said, it's not my time yet. But he go goes ahead and does help them. And the water is changed to wine. And that brings us to last Sunday when Hannah Wilder was here. Uh, and to a two-parter. This is like those shows on TV that the episode finishes with a cliffhanger, and you better turn to it in next week or find the next episode on streaming live. Last Sunday, we heard Jesus go back to his hometown parish church. It would be like uh, someone growing up here in Grego and always being a member of St. Barnabas coming back and then coming up here, not just to read. That's what we heard last week. We just heard him do the reading of the day, the pro prophecy reading for the day. But it stopped right before he started to preach. And as Hannah reminded us, he read from Isaiah. And what Isaiah has to say is almost the same things that Jesus would say, starting at the, that point in his work and all through the next three years. And what a, what a start it was. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to give sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which means to make God's way and will real and active here and now. That's a lot of work. It's almost as if uh, that passage from Isaiah would be the, the motto, the epigram over the next three years. And it says that the eyes of all there are fixed on him. This is their hometown boy. They even say today in the gospel, isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? And uh, aren't the relatives still around here? And then the fun starts, because he actually starts to preach. And he says that, in fact, what you just heard me read from Isaiah is going to be fulfilled right now as you're listening to it. I mean, if I had been sitting there, I would be saying, Really? I mean, Isaiah said that hundreds of years ago. What are you going to do? You can almost see it building. Isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? Hmm. Where is he getting off telling us this stuff? Who does he think he is? And it builds a little bit further. He even says to them, psyching them out, you're probably saying to yourself, hey, kid. Take care of yourself. Physician, heal yourself. And you're probably saying to yourself, hmm, we heard stories of all the healings he did in Capernaum. Well, here we are. This is Nazareth. How about it? 
And then he really throws him a curveball. He says, guess what? You know about the prophet Elijah. He's the greatest of the prophets. When there was a terrible famine for three years in all of Israel and Judah, who does he go to take care of and feed? A widow way up in the north. She's not even one of us. She doesn't belong to our faith. And you take care of her. What about the rest of us? That's <coughs> not enough. This young rabbi Jesus says, remember Elisha? Elisha was a student of Elijah. Has the same power. He even said, give me your power, Father. Give me your cloak. And in Elisha's time, there was a plague. <laughs> Do we know plague, huh? And who is he healing? He's healing some guy from Syria, Naaman, who doesn't even believe in God. And when he tells Naaman, go bathe seven times in the Jordan, Naaman says, you've got to be kidding me. I come from Damascus. We have all kinds of doctors. We have all kinds of medicines. I'm going to go in that stinking river. But his servant says to him, I think you want to do what he's telling you to do. I mean, after all, you do want to get healed, don't you? This is like when we start fighting with our doctors. I'm not sure what we do. And by this point, it says, you heard it. All in the synagogue, all in the church were filled with rage. And I should tell you that there is not a big cliff in Nazareth, but it's a pretty good hill. So if they kicked him down the hill, he'd be pretty bruised and battered at the bottom. What are we being shown? Well, I mean, I think we know already Jesus is the one on whom the Lord has shown favor. And he is the anointed, the Christ. That's what Christ means, the Messiah, the anointed. But really today we're being shown more about ourselves. And most of us don't like to be treated that way. We want to hear what we want to hear. We want religion to fit the way we have always heard the way we think about it, how we process it. So for example, it's not at all unusual that we should think that God would come and take care of things here in our town, in our state, in our county. Don't worry about those people across the border or those people over in another county or in another state. Come on, God. Well, I mean, we're here this morning, you know. How about us? And also, too, each one of us personally hears from God in the scriptures or from the mouths of other people things that strike us to the core and that remind us of how selfish or how stupid or how weak or how crazy we have been in our lives. And do we thank people for telling us that? Most of the time, we get quite angry. Who do you think you are? Why should you be telling me this? I know how to take care of my life. What a first sermon this was. To put in front of his own hometown neighbors people with whom he had grown up. What God has always tried to put before people through his messengers, the prophets, Jesus finally being the last and the greatest of all of those. I love you, God says over and over to his people. I love you. I have betrothed myself to you. I've married you. I've given you everything you need, bread in the desert, quail when there wasn't enough of bread. I've given you water to drink. I gave you a wonderful land that I promised to you. But you keep turning away. You keep finding not just idols of stone or wood that you make. Yes, some of those. But you keep finding the idols of yourself. 
rather than knowing that you were made in the image and likeness of me, your God, you make yourself God. So many great writers in the Christian faith have said this, from St. Augustine to Luther and all the way on down to Richard Moore today. The God we most want to worship is the God who looks and sounds and smells like us. I'm sure some of you are saying, it's not Lent yet. Why are you hitting us over the head? <laughs> it isn't me. This is, this is what the scriptures, part one last week and part two this week, have to say to us. I mean, I could say to you very nicely, take this home and read the second lesson that Jan, Jan read for us. Read it Monday, read it Thursday, because we need to be reminded what love really is. But that's here in the gospel too, isn't it? Because God wants us to be like God, not like us. God wants us to forgive. God wants us to be generous. God wants us to stick up for what we know is right, but also not to demonize the person who is on the other side. And boy, there are lots of people on the other side. God wants us to be aware of people around us and not to obsess on our own health and our own finances and our own kids, grandkids. And if we did those kinds of things, which maybe we don't even need to be reminded are acting like God, then we would be fulfilling what Jesus said in his first sermon, that the oppressed would be free, that the blind would be given sight, the lame able to walk, and that the, the year of the Lord's favor, the time of God's kingdom, of God's rule of love, would come about. Amen.